Well, welcome to Bass and Booze episode number one, our inaugural episode. I'm stoked. How excited are we? So stoked. I am AMP, the bass player. Across from me on the table here, we have Dr. Denson Angulo, the bass doctor. To my left, we have the bass princess, Kaya Kareen. Thank you Ooh. both for joining me today. So let's introduce our featured beverage this evening. Yes, yes. We are drinking margaritas, and it's just key lime juice. A little bit of lemon juice, uh, some triple sec, and Patron Silver with some lime and salt. That is our featured. So cheers. Cheers, you guys. Yes. We got the booze covered. Mmm. Mmm. Margaritas. Delicious. the best. That is very refreshing on this extremely hot day. All right. So, our topic for today is a little bit of a follow-up to a video that Denson and I made a little while ago. Um, It was kind of a shootout between uh, acoustic bass guitar and upright bass. And of the three of us, I'm actually the only one who doesn't play upright, and both of you uh, double on electric and upright. So you you guys have a little more insight into this than, than, uh, than I do, but we got a lot of comments on that video. Like a lot Tons. of comments Tons. on the video, and lots of angry comments. A lot of like critical comments, yeah. but there there were there were some nuggets in there. So I went through the comments through there, and I and I thought I would bring up some of the stuff and just see, like, in spite of that video of being thirty minutes long, we somehow missed stuff, right? As it turns out, so wow. let's okay. I I think I just need to read this one comment here. He he kind of went off and he and uh, I'll I'll just let his words do the talking. He says. I am an intermediate double bassist that have been playing for about three years. I would say that the biggest argument that is kind of ignored is the barrier of entry to double bass. For me to even get semi-good, I had to take lessons at my local junior college for about a year and countless hours of practice, and I would say that even then, I'm just okay at it. Another barrier is the cost of the instrument. Even my cheap plywood bass costs around 1300 plus the electronics I installed for live performance, plus experimenting with different strings, which are crazy expensive compared to bass guitar strings, which are already on the expensive side. While it is definitely the superior instrument, you seriously you have to be seriously dedicated to it, uh, both time-wise and financially. So, how true has that been for you guys' experience? I, I actually kind of somewhat agree with with what he said yeah i think there are creative ways to get around some of that stuff like the cost of an upright there's there are um, ways to finance uprights and and get a good one where you don't have to pay for it all up front and Mm -hmm. can do things like that but i mean upright strings are crazy expensive Mm -hmm. and i definitely have dedicated more of my time personally to practicing upright and it does carry over to electric i do have to you know uh, a lot separate time periods for both instruments still but if my upright stuff is in shape electric feels easier yeah yeah so yeah. but they, they're not like you you practice one and you can you can play both sort of a deal at all you have to like treat them like separate instruments for sure yeah i would i would think i totally agree with you like you know i've been playing bass for 30 years now and upright i've been playing upright for 29 of those years and playing upright is it's definitely the yeah it's hard to get into if you're not really wanting to get into it um i have a little bit of a spin on that too because when i did my doctorate i wanted to do classical music so with classical music not only do you have all the same kind of practice regimen to to play pop or jazz but also the the quality of the instrument has to be that much more like you know i can play jazz on a thirteen hundred dollar bass like this this person is suggesting Mm -hmm. but i can't be in a symphony orchestra on a thirteen hundred dollar bass i need at least a ten thousand dollar bass or more what what does the extra money buy you though exactly so what you're paying for a lot of the time you're paying for quality of craftsmanship um and age you know so um one of my good friends and teachers is John Patitucci. And he bought a French bass from the 1800s, like a 19th century French bass. And as I recall, it was a six figure instrument. You know? <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. But, yeah. you know, that's John Patitucci, like a Grammy winning, you know, top A list tier bass player. 
Yeah. I am you, not one of you those. You can justify those kinds of expenses when it, it's your whole thing and you're among you, the best in the world at it. Right, right. But symphony players will spend that much money on a, on a symphony bass. You know, and you're you're paying for again craftsmanship and age. Usually, a uh, symphony section, like the average age of a bass in a symphony section, is seventy five years or or you know around there. And I'm just pulling that out of my butt because I'm drinking booze. <laughs> like statistics are being made up here, but they're old. You know, my upright bass, my personal instrument, is eighty three years old. Oh yeah, the, the yeah. K. Yeah, yeah, and it's a it's made of plywood. You know, my base is made of plywood, but because it's so old, it's worth five figures. You know, it's like a $15,000 instrument. My bow is worth $5,000. It's a handmade bow. It's stupid. You know, so to go on with that, what that person said, yeah, it's very cost prohibitive if you're just like, oh, I'm going to buy an upright base, you know, like you really want to. If you really want to do it, like for realsies, for realsies, like I want to audition for symphony. I want to major in music like Kaya's bass is worth a lot of bread. You know, what is yours? Like five grand? Your bass is. My bass actually is when I got it was probably eight grand. Oh, yeah. But okay. I put work into it now. too. So it's probably so. worth 10. Yeah, at least I've played your bass. It's awesome. Your bass feels so good. Your bass sounds so good. I like my bass. Yeah, and so, you know, when you're a professional upright player, like, and that's what you do, and you make money doing that, and people call you because they know you can do that, and you study with the people, like I study with Patitucci, you've studied with, you know, Ron Carter once removed, right? <laughs> Dr. Phil Keen is your teacher who studied with Ron Carter. Like, we've got that sort of, uh, you know, it sounds snooty, but it's like, I, we have lineage, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like we've studied with the masters of our instrument. And so we have that perspective, that investment, that that time, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the shedding. And it's hard to get into upright bass. So, you, yeah, it's a you, lifestyle. Um, you bring up something else that I was kind of thinking of here, too, is like um, you're getting calls specifically for your upright bass skills. Yep. Do you have you ever heard of anyone ever getting called for an acoustic bass gig? Uh, uh, I, I actually have had one acoustic one? bass. It's gig. happened? Yeah. I'm, I am shocked. Like, I had one gig. Dude, that deserves a cheers. Shout out cheers. to Shit, Kaya did it. I'll tell you what it, what it was Ugh. after we take our All right. mm-hmm. Can't forget the booze part. It's critical. Um, it was, shout out to KRCL, because it was when they <laughs> featured my Amy Winehouse tribute band on their, uh, yeah. their segment. Um, women who rock and the studio is so small they needed acoustic instruments and so I was mm. like I'll bring my upright and she was like no it's not gonna fit <laughs> like you have to be acoustic no amps but like you're up so I had I had to have really they specifically was it your instrument it. or did so you borrow it I, I had to borrow one so I, <laughs> sh- shout out to Max Muscolino who let me borrow his oh my god okay here's the funny thing about that oh my god the bass that we borrowed for your video, was it that same? Was Tacoma? Max's bass? Oh my god! So there's only oh my one god. of okay. those in Salt Lake. Yeah. Hang on, there is there is one like one one bass just getting passed around like the town whore, yeah. just being like for all for all of these acoustic bass gigs. Is that and one it's Thunder Max's Chief? Bass. Thank you, Max, for your Thunder Chief. That's awesome. Oh, man. Well, tell us more about that gig. How did it go? Like, what were there any like specific challenges to to, to playing acoustic bass specifically? Because obviously you didn't own one, and so like. Was right. it hard to like make that work for for the performance? It, it was a little weird because I'd never played on it, and I just picked it up the morning of and and just went for it. But I mean, if it, it just feels kind of like a an awkward electric because it's just <laughs> yeah. it's just bulkier. Yeah. But it's just like playing electric. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny, dude. Oh man, the same freaking bass. That is hilarious. Yes, that bass gets around. I nice. actually this is worth mentioning. I just recently bought a new amp from House of Guitars and while I was in there they have one acoustic bass hanging on the wall right now. Whoa. And I was browsing, I was just standing there looking at all the basses and one of the the workers there made a comment to me about it and he's like cuz I had my upright with me. I was trying it on the amp. Oh, yeah. And he was like, "What do you think of those acoustic basses?" <laughs> <laughs> 
I was hmm. like, no, that's where it's at. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But he asked me. It was pretty funny. That is funny. I'm, I'm sure they're they're uh, they're desperately trying to sell it to somebody. Right. And they're like, somebody get this out of here. What would be funny is if it was Max's on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> no. there, there is one acoustic bass in, in all of Salt, Salt Lake, Lake City. City. No, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's awesome. You either play upright or... Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, is, that, that, how much overlap is there really between those two, though? Um, you know, I, uh, I almost I don't I don't I think don't, there's actually a lot. No, but it, it, the upright is so hard to play. Like it's so grueling on your left, both hands. Like yeah, it's your physical, hands get so strong. Mm-hmm. Then when you play electric, it's it just feels it's easy. easy. Yeah. So like today we did a setup on your bass, and yeah. I'm like, oh, sorry, I'm kind of heavy handed. You know, I have to be aware of how deep I dig in when I'm playing electric. You know, so that I don't overplay the pickups or buzz the neck or, you know, because it's when I'm really playing upright bass a lot and I go to electric, it's just a little toy, you know, as far as like physical, you know, it's not hard to play. I can play electric for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, you know, but I'll do like a nine hour gig on upright you know or like you know the nine hour gig. well you know like a day where i'm doing one gig here and one gig here and one gig. Oh, the longest okay, okay. gig i ever played was like 10 and a half hours and it was a jazz festival but it was Ooh. all day long rehearsal in the morning a show a show a show a show a show oh man you know fingers and, would be shredded oh, yeah, by the they end were of that. yeah my calluses our calluses are are thick and oh yeah awesome so that's that's to the point of that that comment it it is kind of a disservice to the instrument to try to be a hobbyist upright because it is such a yeah hobbyist upright yeah that's yeah. not something you you either like are an upright player or you don't bother with it you can't help but fall in love with it though if you mm-hmm. if you get a good upright and you start on it like yeah. and you put the time in like just the sound of the instrument is so beautiful oh yeah it's yeah. just it's awesome. there there's that clip of you playing and and my dog just like Oh yeah, Taco. <laughs> oh, he watching. was so entrapped because he doesn't care. Like when I play, I play bass. Like even if I just like have it through the amp or whatever, he's just like eh, well, whatever. But like when Denson came over and played upright, he was just was like staring bow. at him. He was just he like, was like Whoa. doggy, watch me. Oh, he was yeah. He, he enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Super fun. Yeah, but you know it takes a lot of time, a lot of hours to be able to create that kind of sound plus the gear, you know, mm. to create that kind of sound like. I can tell the difference between my bow and a two thousand dollar bow, <laughs> you know, both by sound and by how it feels in my hand. Mm-hmm. You know, it's crazy, and it sucks that it's that expensive. But you know, you're paying for the sound that you're gonna get. You also kind of work up to it, like yes, you know, you don't yeah. have to. You don't have to start with the Mm-mm. fifteen thousand dollar base. You can start and. You know, well, they, start they with a cheaper bow and rental as programs you get, that you can like yeah, rent, rent to own, own some sort of a own. thing. Like, I've got several students that are doing rent to own. Rent to own is the best. Yeah. Um, and then like upgrades and stuff. I had this one student that started with me when he was eleven, and he was like four foot nine when he was eleven. Right. <laughs> so he's so he's playing on a like a one eighth size upright, and he's renting it right. And as he grows, he rents another one. And as he grows, he rents another one. And then, you know, puberty strikes. Now the kid is six foot two. Oh, jeez. Right? And so then he's like, okay, I really want to do this. For, for, for realsies, I'm going to invest in my own, you know, student quality instrument with certain features. Like the top is a solid piece or maybe a two-piece carved top mm-hmm. as opposed to plywood. You know, and you go through all these upgrades as you, as you go through it. Yeah, yeah, like you, I, I feel like people are so quick to try and get their forever bass right away yeah. when it's 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 just it's just gear. Yeah, it comes and goes, and like yeah. the people that buy and sell gear a lot, like that's kind of like another end of the, of the extreme. But like mm. you're you're not married to your gear un- unless you are, then you're weird. I am. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. I'm like, married to my upright. But, yeah, me too. But that's after. You know, putting in the time to tweak it and yeah. And- well, how many how many bases did you go through until you got the one that you currently have? It actually is the only upright I ever have. Oh, I, is it? But I really lucked out. I did my homework. I did my research. I knew mm. what I was looking for, and it just it just worked out really well. I I was lucky. Yeah, 
I got lucky too. My because yours is the same one that you had yeah, since you were I got a teen. It when I was sixteen years old. Yeah, yeah. And but I've put a lot of work into it. You know, I took the shellac finish off and refinished it myself. Helped the tone immensely. I got a new fingerboard. I had the neck work done. I have an extension on it. Like just upgrading what I have because buying an upright is a thing. You know, it's yeah. hard to do. Yeah. It's it, hard it's, to get. It, Kind of feels to me like a like a pirate to their ship. Yes, <laughs> that's a great analogy. I love <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, this giant piece of wood, and yes. and it's it's your whole thing, and you yeah. just like kind of keep cobbling together little bits and pieces wow, of it. That's and, so yeah. true, and it's all great the, and stuff analogy. happens to your your ship. Yeah. The like, I know all well, the scratches. It, yeah, plug the holes. Yep. I've had some incidents. Oh, I yes. remember when your base was. It was just was it just last summer that your upright was in the shop. Yeah, I, I, I remember that. It was a sad day. Fell on it and broke a whole chunk of it off. There was a Ooh, hole, and you could top, just right? you just see right into the yeah. whole body of the bag. It was awful. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it took like a month to fix. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's a thing, a labor. So so given all this though, you you guys both double on both electric and upright. Do you consider yourself more one than the other, or do you do more of your work on one than the other? You get mm. called more for for upright or electric. You know, um, I don't know. I I don't. I've never really run the math for me. Um, yeah, I I feel like it's almost equal. Like people know that I. And play classically, so I actually get a lot of classical recording sessions. Oh, okay. Or like theater gigs, because I play with the bow. Um, but I play electric too, so I'm in a rock band, jazz, whatever. Like, I feel like it's kind of equalish. I don't know. I feel like mine's pretty equal too, actually. Yeah. I keep I've doing got, lots of jazz and pop, and yeah, I've got the party band and the rock band thing. I do a lot of jazz one-offs. <laughs> kind of ends up being both. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Like, what's kind of fun for me is I have all these bases. You can see them yeah. in the background. <laughs> and it's not even all of them. No, it's not. <laughs> when people call me for gigs, I'll ask them what kind of bass they want. It's almost like they can place, place an order for their bass tone. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, what kind of gig is it? Oh, it's a metal gig. Okay, I'll bring this. Or it's kind of a jazz gig, but you don't have to bring your upright. All right, I'll play a fretless. Yeah. You know? So it's kind of cool. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's pretty equal, you know, even even still. I think that's the case for most of the upright players I know. Maybe there are a few here in town who get most of the upright gigs, but. I would say, like, if you're in a bluegrass band, you're not going to play electric much. But you and I are so versatile with different styles. You know? And that's just kind of like my whole shtick with teaching students. You know, I want my students to be crossover players. Mm. You know, I want them to play with the bow. I want them to play upright jazz. I want them to play Latin music. I want them to play electric, punk, what else? Yeah, there's like, there's nothing that's not worth learning, even just for the sake of it. Even yeah. if it never becomes relevant to what you do. Like, it all like feeds into just you being a better bass player overall. I feel like anything worth learning is worth learning. Yeah. You know, so I do my own setups. Okay, yeah. so uh, segueing from there... So, if you couldn't do upright bass, what would be your best alternative? Because there were people that were saying, like, well, what do you think about the U bass? Or what do you think about, like, a resonator bass? Or a sousaphone, even? <laughs> there is a bass player here in town who does the sousaphone yeah. thing. That's, that's got to be, like, a, a cool, like, like, niche to have, though. It's like, hey, I'm the guy who, who plays bass, but also sousaphone. Gigs. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, just a comment on that, that's historically the double. Before electric existed, if you played upright, you also played tuba. Or yeah. Sousaphone. Like, that was your double. Now that electric is around, if you're doubling for, like, a theater gig or a marching gig or whatever kind of gig, you know, you play electric and acoustic. Most bass players don't play sousaphone anymore. Most. Yeah. I know of two guys, the one we're thinking of, we can mention him. He's awesome. Alex, Alex Rowe. Rowe. We He's love awesome. you. Yeah, we love Alex Rowe. <laughs> and then there's another guy that plays bass and, and tuba as well. But he's mostly a tuba player. He can just play electric bass. Interesting. He doesn't play upright at all. Hmm. Where Alex, he can do electric really well, he plays upright really well, and he plays tuba. Yeah, it's no fair. He plays all the instruments. I actually played he tuba in college. Renaissance man. He's a renaissance yeah. man. Dude, check out his record. It's actually really fun. 
It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. I forget what it's called. Dang it. What's the title? Uh, songs from 1990 Never. Never. Thank you. Yeah, never. <laughs> she gets more sleep than I do, I think. Well, see. Oh, I definitely if... do not. <laughs> But yeah, well, the the crossover there is is even less than than the skills that would transfer from upright to uh, to electric. Oh, then. Yeah, if you're going to play electric and then tuba, yeah. like that is not even the the same class of instrument. You have to like start yeah. from square one there. And the the style as a tubist, you know, in <laughs> in the pop world, yeah, as Alex does, like he does like New Orleans second line. Oh yeah, kind of marching band, you know, jazz with that Dixieland jazz and second line jazz. And that's specific to the sousaphone or tuba. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something he can do. Whereas, you know, historically, when that music went from outside on the street during Mardi Gras to inside, like tuba is way too effing loud. We can't have you. Can you play this thing? You know, and that's when second line and jazz started being played on the acoustic bass was because they were bringing in the mansions, you know, whatevs. Not having right. to fill up a, 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 a street corner, you're in a club. Right. So I to kind of go back to what you asked before, I feel like it's sort of stylistic based. You know, like what kind of music could you play on Upright and what could be the alternative for that? So sometimes when I play jazz, um, especially if it's like an outdoor gig that's pretty casual, I'll bring a fretless electric instead. Because I don't want my fifteen thousand dollar bass in the scorching heat. I don't need seams popping up and or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I've had a few requests this last bit for synth bass. That that's yeah. actually what I've been working on. I've got a little novation and I and well, you know, like I feel like Desmond beats me to the punch on oh everything. My gosh. Yeah. I, he's who has got me going on that too. Yeah, yeah. His yeah. setup is incredible. It's awesome. He he took me through I went and I watched him play on Thursday and he took me through his whole rig and oh my gosh, He's so fun to play. Oh my gosh, he's good. You know, yeah, al- that's what I want to work on is the synth. to getting innovation. I mean, I play keyboard. Yeah. I could, but I was like, you know what? Better bass player on a string <laughs> bass. And I so got the C4. The C4 is and it's cool. awesome. Guys, it's rad. It's worth checking out. Yeah. That's that's the that's the one that everybody's like if you're even gonna get like a like an envelope filter, people like the C4 is like the best envelope filter, good. plus a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, like it's that that pedal is pretty killer. Yep. So yeah. I I don't know, I don't know what so, the alternative so, is gonna be. U bass maybe. So what do you have for the big three here though? So you have electric bass, and then maybe you have upright bass, and then is like synth bass like your yeah. other like pillar, and then everything else sort of exists in like little uh, smaller segments in between those yeah, somehow. I would think so. Because, like, aside from, the like, the one, one-off one situation where you needed an acoustic bass, like, people are not going to call you for, oh, oh, you're the guy with the U bass. I want that specifically. No. Or but you're the guy with the resonator bass. The yeah. You know, we're playing second-line jazz. Mm-hmm. We, want, we know you play the tuba. They will do that. But, yeah, they're not going to call me for, to play Ashbury rubber bass or U bass. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, you know. yeah. But they, they would call, oh, you're the guy that also does synth bass. Like, for mm-hmm. our pop thing, that's mm-hmm. perfect. Like... You you would you would definitely like that would be a skill that would be um, sought after yep. as opposed to like oh you own an acoustic bass like that's cool I, I have guess you seen, uh, have you seen the Instagram guy that plays the Novation oh the, the real free yes yeah, yeah he uh, awesome. what's his name because he Can't he'll remember. like he'll play the same line on both on electric and then and it's like on his keyboard he's incredible with yeah, both first of all but like. Like to have that option, like ooh, can we we can go with either or? Like that's yep. that's actually like super cool for him. Yeah, and I think also there's sort of a visual thing, mm. you know, like that looks really cool how he's like holding it this way and yeah, whatever. you know, if I'm playing electric bass and you hear a Moog synth, maybe that's not as cool to see, but it sounds just ooh. the same. No, you're actually hitting on uh, another perfect point because a lot of people brought up about the acoustic bass is like, well, the reason that I wanted to play an acoustic bass guitar was because of uh, MTV Unplugged back in the 90s. Yeah. Like, Alice in Chains did it, and I thought that was so cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is like, how important is the aesthetic if you were if you were going to do like acoustic bass for like a singer-songwriter thing? That's about yeah. the only reason in my mind to do it, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, the aesthetic is kind of the... Yeah. Big and if if you need that acoustic like look and feel, but you don't play upright, that's kind of in my mind the main reason to bust out one of those acoustic basses. 
So, so specific, uh, specifically for your Amy Winehouse thing at KRCL, why instead, of, like, because you couldn't bring the upright because it was too big, why not bring the electric? Because the overlap of, of like, actual sound that you would get was, is, is pretty similar. Like, you, you could get close enough with an electric. What right. was was there a reason specifically like that you went for the uh, the acoustic bass guitar? They requested I don't have an amp either. They, oh, so that, that's they, what they it was. That's right. Pretty much left me with that being the wow. best the best option. Well, that's because, kind of the only option, think, really. I think they're actually not typically used to having bass players be a part of that segment, frankly, because mm. it's it's like an acoustic time it's like singer and a guitar player. or something? Yeah, maybe okay. some you know other easily acoustic instruments. <laughs> a tambourine. Yeah, so. I I've, I did a, a thing at KRCL one time, and they just had like the full regular band. I wonder if it's just like the, it the, the difference in we shows. In. Yeah, because I've played I've played there more than once. We I did another thing with uh, my Christmas Fire jazz album release, mm. and they had they let us be a full quartet in a different room, and we all set up together. But nice. it was the room they were going to have us in for that segment that day. Was it uh, filmed? The or just audio? Um, I think just audio. Mm. Which is probably a mistake. Interesting. I think we filmed the Christmas Fire one. I don't think we filmed the Amy Jade one. Mm. But the audio, we have the whole audio for Amy Jade. Nice. And it sounds great. Cool. Even you, with the acoustic bass. Do you hear <laughs> like a huge difference in how they mixed your acoustic bass sound on those recordings? Maybe we should listen to it. Yeah. That might be kind of fun. It's we'll, online. We'll, we'll insert we audio insert, right yeah. here. Well, insert a little snippet. Because yeah, because because what I've heard of most of of acoustic bass guitar, it kind of seems like yeah, it does sound like its own thing. But it's like you can get like eighty percent of the way there with a P bass. Mm-hmm. Just like turn the tone all the way off and like bam, like, there you are. Like right. I don't it's, know. Yeah, it kind of just sounds like a wobbly electric. A wobbly electric. <laughs> 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 but it, but as far as like the the visuals of it, like there's definitely something to that. Because yeah. I mean, yeah. if like I I uh, I passed on a, a jazz gig specifically, like because Jake now does the the Wednesday night thing at Lake Effect, I told him like, ah, you if you're gonna do like jazz night there, you want a guy who plays uh, like upright. You yeah. don't you don't want me because I I don't know anything about upright, and mm-hmm. so like let let somebody who actually plays jazz on an upright do that gig because like one it it'll be like the right sound, but like two, it's mostly about the 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 aesthetic. Cause, it, cause he's big on the aesthetic now. He's got like plants and and, right. and everything <laughs> and the lighting piano. and the upright piano is like old. Mm-hmm. It's 1900s. it's it's a whole thing, but like it's important that the upright be there for the aesthetic. But does the acoustic bass have that same kind of a thing? If you're gonna do like just like a an acoustic you know air quote duo, and you bring your electric bass, are you cheating? And I I kind of mm. I kind of don't think so, but I think there are people who would disagree with me on that. Yeah, I, I think I I think we're just gonna have the unique perspective as upright players. Like, yeah, I have a thing where I I try to play my upright as much as possible. So yeah. if I do get those acoustic calls, I'm actually trying to bring my upright, even though it's more of a pain. Yeah. Like, I have the party band gigs where you do the dance kind of party set, but they always want like a dinner cocktail set, yeah, yeah, as our yep. friend. Yeah. And I'll if it's a local gig, I will bring my upright yep. still just to play that 45 minute jazz set yep because it just feels more right yep well and, and how memorable well, and is that right. if you show up with your your giant upright that's cool yeah, people love it that's people so love it. cool people who are not musicians see that shape you know and they're just like wow that's so cool that's so big you know that Would, part's amazing if you yeah. play it you should be gifting the world with it yeah <laughs> so, so do yeah. people when when you see an acoustic bass guitar doesn't that just kind of get confused for an acoustic guitar? Yeah. Like people aren't going to have that same kind of a reaction to right. it. Like no, yeah, they'll well, think it's an acoustic oh, there's guitar. There's a guitar player yeah, for sure, over there. for sure. Yeah, right. People think my upright bass is a cello half the time. They yes, will right. definitely think that <laughs> the, the acoustic bass is a guitar. <laughs> yeah, cello. It's not a cello. Yeah. It's. it's <laughs> I just say yeah, thanks. You know, what a great looking cello. Oh, thank you very much. You know, grandma, mm-hmm. grandma of the wedding. You know. Dude, a lot of like the stereotypical things that the bassists complain about getting all the time, I never do. Like the, oh, why does your guitar look weird? And like, why yeah. is it? I've never, ever heard that. It's Nobody's not, ever said that to me. I think it's more of an upright thing. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I get it as much with electric. Mine's the, well, that's a big guitar. 
Mm, okay. I get the like. Or that guitar is bigger than you. <laughs> you say, "Yep, I'm compensating. Leave me alone." <laughs> I, I get that, but like with the sexist undertone of like oh, when I'm God. carrying my upright and people are like, "Do you need help with that?" And oh, they're yeah. like astounded, and I'm like, "This is my instrument." Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to help you carry that. I chose to play this. I knew I was getting into. You know, I have a funny little uh, quip when people say stuff like that. They'll be like, wow, isn't it so heavy? Or whatever comment, you know, just talking about how it is physically a pain to move around. My quip is always like, oh, it's fine. I'm a trained professional. You know, like, <laughs> I'm a trained professional. You know, like, oh, can I get the door for you? And it's like, no, I'm good. I'm a trained professional. And then I'll do it myself. Or can I help you out the cart? No, I'm a trained professional. It's, it's true. People yeah, don't realize it's like, this. They don't but... realize that. Like, I mean, I've. It's, I've part, taught, of the, it's part of the lifestyle. It totally is. Yeah. I've, I've even taught students, like, hold it this way and it's way more manageable through a door you know no seriously like there are techniques for every part of it the bass player knows how to open doors with no hands like with their body body shoulder legs we're masters of that we're independent those are the things that only a great teacher will teach you (laughs) it's like you can sit down and play scales and learn fret like note names and whatever but like Ah, to pack in your gear, that is that is a different skill set. Yeah. To load your upright into a, a small car. A Kia no. Soul. Oh, yeah. man. Okay, tell me about the worst load-in you've ever had. Please. Oh, you guys dude. have got to have some 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 load-in stories. Oh, yeah. and, I, and I'll give you a buffer here, because I've got one. Because, yeah. like, in, in, in my room, uh, what is it? It's Funk and Dive up in Ogden. Have you guys oh, ever played there? I've, that I've place, supposed to. That place later. is the worst worst loading ever and i've and i i just like because i i usually try and pack as light as possible i'm i'm amplest now but like even just like i have a 210 combo like i'm not gonna go any bigger for that like there's just no reason to but i i watch guys with like the big like 810 fridge, fridge oh stacks God. with the the svt on top which is cool and i want one but i would never take it anywhere but the load in for funk and dive specifically is that um you go into the back parking lot and then you have to go down like four stairs so you're already going like downstairs and then you go down this hallway and then you have to load into like this little service elevator that's like right in the middle of the building and that elevator goes down and it's a tiny ass little elevator. It's it's literally like five feet by five feet. Like you could not lay down in that elevator. It's so tiny. So like you go down this elevator into the basement where the venue is and then you um, are you end up in like a storage room of some kind. It's the weird. It's like dark. It's weird. It oh, no. feels like creepy. terrible and creepy. I'm supposed to play there next month. You're gonna you're gonna experience. <laughs> it. I'm, I'm I'm like prepping you. That's so awesome. then you have to like go like kind of back towards the way that you came to go like back down towards where you need to be, and then you go down a step into where they have a green room, I guess. Because it has like couches and chairs on either okay. side, and then you go through the green room, and then you have to go back up a step, and then you end up behind where the the band plays, and there's like billiards tables behind the band. The stage is super weird there, and and then you have to like go down a couple steps to get onto the stage, and then you're there finally. <laughs> and can you okay? And like me, like loading in my my combo, it's just like eh, you know, like whatever, that's fine, that's annoying, but whatever. But like watching this dude like trying to wheel his eight ten and his in his big oh, tube head into there, oh, the it was stairs. like this club only holds seventy five people. Why wow. did you bring that? Wow. <laughs> oh man. Well, that's good to know. Thank you for the hot yeah. Tip. Don't pack heavy I won't. if you go to Funk and Dive. I'll bring oh, a two ten. Fun venue to play, Gosh. not a fun venue to load into. Wow. <laughs> So the uprights have got to be a whole different thing, though, because like, yeah, that elevator, I think you probably could just barely get an upright into. And I'm trying to think there's. It's, it was years and years and years ago, and I haven't played at this place, but it was like this mansion. That people will sometimes rent. I can't remember what it's called because it was forever ago, but there it's old. It's like a hundred year old building. And at the time, they had not met their ADA requirements for elevators. So it was stairs, Mm. stairs. And the staircase is a spiral staircase. Oh, no. So, like, and and the gig was two flights up from the main floor. But you get to the main floor with these big, long Transylvanian marble steps. So it's like steps, steps, steps front door foyer go in 
spiral staircase, like one of those metal spiral staircase to get to this special place that was the loft or whatever, you know, where this gig was, this jazz gig. And so I'm like holding my, I had to hold the bass in front of me because I couldn't like put it on my shoulder. Usually upright players will put it on their shoulder Mm. or maybe they have backpack straps or whatever. And so I had to like strap the strap around my back and hold it in the front and I had to take, you know, you were pregnant with seven, an with an upright. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> My six foot tall baby in the front of me, you know, and so I had to like slowly, oh, like as man. vertically as possible, go up these stairs because the base is so much taller than I am in the front that it would it, if I, you know, raise too much, too like too much vigor in my up step, the headstock would smack the stair, yeah. into the stairs above me and the stairs were so narrow that I couldn't strap it on the back and get the fat ass of my butt <laughs> upright around the spiral staircase. <laughs> so that was probably the worst to oh, get man. up that up those stairs. And um and then I had to go back down and do the same it was better with the amp, but I had to go up, you know, carry the cabinet, you know, because I'm a head and cabinet person. And at the time, I didn't have any of the Aguilar stuff. So oh, it was, man. yeah, it was a drag. <laughs> it was a drag. Dang. Who, who designed spiral staircases for a load-in? That would be awful. Yeah, that's Yeah, it was good. dreadful. It's like like moving furniture in, in a really, like, inconvenient New York apartment. Except that's kind of just your whole thing as an upright player. <laughs> you know, one of the things about, um, like, load-ins and stuff like that, too, is, like, you like your emergency break, you know, of your of the top of your bass. You had that accident. You know, that's the thing about playing upright bass. When you break your instrument, you're screwed. Like gig's over. You know, you break a string on an electric, you can finish the gig. You break a string on upright, your bridge goes Wah! and then you're mm. you're out of tune, you're done. You know, one time I was your doing sound a gig. Post probably falls yeah, down. your sound <laughs> yes, the tension changes so the sound post drops and then it sounds like garbage. No. Like I was doing a gig on a cruise ship and I had an upright bass. And it was a it was a tour from New York to London and then we were gonna tour tour the UK. Well, on the ship, it was a cruise ship, like first leg was the cruise ship, then we get off and we tour the UK. We tour England, Mm. Great Britain. So I'm getting the bass, and it's in one of those big coffin, sarcophagus, you know, cases, right? So I open it up, and I'm getting ready to get the bass out to unload it, to get it over to the stage. And the ship is just like, woo, up and down these huge Atlantic waves, northern Atlantic Atlantic waves, you know. And so I feel the gravity kind of come out of my body, and then... It sets in, and I fell into the sarcophagus case. Oh. And then the case shut on my head, like no. on my back. It was like a bad sitcom or whatever. But the weight of the, the wave and my body, I broke the neck off of that upright base. Oh. Yeah. So, game over for the rest of the tour until we got to the mainland or till, till, we, till we got to the UK. I had an electric with me. It was a fretless electric. Um, I played the rest of the cruise ship gigs on that electric bass. But, you know, that's the risk as far as, like, having an upright bass that we take. Like, loading it into the car, we have to be so careful not to crack something or break a string or, you know, it's rare to break a string on an upright, but it happens. It's rare to happen what, you know, what happened to me, what happened to Kai with your bass, just random gusts of gravity yeah well and, and i guess that like electric is inexpensive enough that it's not too terrible to just have a backup i i used to take two bases the gigs for a long time yeah. but it just i just never needed the other one but like if you're playing upright that you have your one upright yeah, yeah i'm not gonna take two to a gig oh my gosh can you imagine yeah I've this, done this it, is actually, my backup upright <laughs> i did it one time you did it i had two uprights of on a of course you did denson's done everything oh god so one bass was solo tuned for a concerto, and the other bass was my section bass. What's the difference? So solo tuning is when you're a solo instrument, it's a whole step higher. So it's an F-sharp string, 
a B string, an E string, and an A string, as opposed to E A D G. What What's the reasoning for that? Um, it's like a brighter sound, and then of course it's higher in pitch. So uh, yeah, for higher is like solo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. that makes so, sense. So and it's a transposing instrument at that point. Mm. So even though I read music in the key of G, it sounds like the key of A. It's just a little brighter, a little higher pitched. You know, it's a classical nerd thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I had two basses on that gig. Two upright basses. That's the only time, one time in my whole life. Yeah, yeah. But I've done. Talk about a, a niche of a niche. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which is what an acoustic bass guitar Which is. Which is what we're talking about. Yeah. Niche bring it, niche, bringing niche. it back around. Here we go. You need to finish your I know. booze. I know. You're going to chug drink, it. Drink faster. Bass and booze, number bass one. Bass and booze, episode number one. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We'll be back, hopefully, at some point with a new topic, a new drink, and we will see you then. Thanks for joining us. Peace out, y'all. Well, that was fun. <laughs>